Good morning, Jags. This is Fahad. Today is Tuesday, February 23rd. Let's get started. I'm going to have rather just uh, qualitative thoughts on the market, given the significant amount of volatility in the past couple of days, rather than give you any specific stock related play here, because I want to see exactly how the day will progress. As we're starting this webinar, or this morning conversation, I should say, the NASDAQ futures are down 1.7%, or 223 points. S&P is down 18 points. Russell is down 23 points. But Dow is flat. Dow is actually slightly in green, just like Dow yesterday, too, was actually hanging on just fine. Now, the, as I mentioned, for several days now, and Last week, we also recommended by input options in XLY, which is the consumer discretionary ETF, as well as in Peloton, PTON, which for many, many JAG Pro clients have worked out pretty nicely. But, you know, the, the entire weakness is basically is, is to be seen in the tech sector. The problem is that during the pandemic, the tech sector became a very large piece of the S&P. As you remember, I used to show charts after charts that just the top five uh, dogs or top five biggest mega cap stocks of NASDAQ, that's Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and I believe Facebook, they ended up becoming about 26% of the S&P weighting when they used to be only 10% before the pandemic. And so the, when these big giants are seeing the technical pressure naturally it is impacting the S&P. And when S&P is rolling over, you're seeing the rest of the market come down in sympathy with it. But I want to once again point out that on a beta adjusted basis, a beta adjusted basis, there's significant amount of strength is still underneath the market in the small cap and the mid cap space. In fact, yesterday too, at one point when NASDAQ was down more than 200 points, uh, Russell 2000 index was actually flat. In fact, at one point, it was up almost 0.3% before giving up some of those games, gains towards the end of the session. Today, again, the futures NASDAQ is down 1.7%, but Russell is down only 1%. We'll see if Russell will try to basically make another rally today um, or attempt a rally to get back to green. If you look at when pre-market, What's working? Once again, it's the energy sector that's working. Here's XOP. It's going to once again open up about one and a half percent. Valero is looking to open higher by about one and a half percent. Marriott is up about two percent. Southwest Airlines is up about two percent. Um, United Airlines is once again flat to slightly positive, up about 1%. You can just go down the list, the same kind of uh, travel stocks that have been working, they continue to work. So all the reopening stocks. And then even in Asia, um, there was a huge surge in reopening stocks. ZNH, which is China Southern Airlines, is gapping higher sharply this morning, and it's going to open up by more than 10%. It's going to open actually at new 52 week high and across the board, all airlines in Asia and Europe were rallying sharply while tech weakness continued across the board. Financials are showing strength. Take a look at transportation also, for example, here's IYT. IYT is the most liquid ETF for all truckers and railroads. This was hitting new 52 week high yesterday. I mean, you look at this chart, you see any weakness here? No, it broke out through $230 resistance on Friday. That strength continued on Monday. And again, in pre-market, this is looking to open slightly higher. This is transportation index, no weakness here. You look at XLI, industrial sector of the US economy, no weakness here. This was making a new 52-week high yesterday. And once again, this is going to power higher with Caterpillar. And in, among the big cap names such as Caterpillar, take a look at the breakout in Caterpillar yesterday. Look at that monster candle yesterday. John Deere, new 52-week high yesterday. You, got, you also saw a lot of strength yesterday in defense contractors, such as Raytheon was starting to make a comeback despite Pratt & Whitney in engine failing off. But then also you saw strength in Lockheed Martin. 
right? This was a bullish engulfing candle yesterday. You saw strength in Huntington Ingalls. Look at that big breakout in this defense contractor. General Dynamics is breaking out from the bull flag. Yesterday, it did not care about the market sell-off. And you can just go down the list. Here's Northrop Grumman, also with a bullish engulfing candle yesterday. So that's industrial, that's energy, that's transportation. And now you go to financials, XLF, XLF. I mean, all the big banks are in this. New 52-week high yesterday. 32.83 is where it went out or 32.71 it closed yesterday. It does not care about market selling off. Why? Because the 10 minus two yield spread is rising with TLT consistently falling. Right. I mean, so this is basic, basically breaking out what weakness here. You cannot tell any weakness over here. You do not see these big giant sectors, the whole banking sector breaking out to a new 52 week high. If you were suddenly concerned about economic meltdown or, some, or something, the entire weakness is concentrated in tech. So you look at QQQ and that's what you see. On rising volume, QQQ is rolling over. And then you look at, um, for example, XLK, which is the other ETF for, for tech sector, it's rolling over. Or if you go very specific, you look at IGV, which is software sector, that's where a lot of froth is, it's rolling over. The entire weakness is concentrated in the tech sector and nothing else in the market. Nothing else in the market. Do not ignore what's happening underneath the market. There is a very large segment of the market, and this is exactly what you should expect in a bull market. You would expect participation to be strong, especially at times when there is weakness is spreading across the board, and you're starting to see some cracks forming. When you got financials leading, transportations leading, industrials leading, energy leading, metals and mining leading, uh, construction and infrastructure stocks leading, it's only tech. It's only tech. That's where. Now, one of two ways this will get resolved, and we will find out. And that's why I want to see exactly what will happen by 11 o'clock today or by noon today, mid morning to late morning, to see whether we're going to start to see some signs. One of two things are going to happen. Considering these big giants, the tech giants, account for more than 25% of the total weighting in the S&P 500 index. Right. And they are the one that are selling off and they were the ones that were the biggest beneficiaries of um, of COVID when, you know, during the shutdown phase last year. Either they're going to push the rest of the market lower along with them, causing a last flush out of all things with froth coming out from every place along the way. And frankly, I don't even believe there's froth in transportation or industrials or, and, or many of those names that I just mentioned that are running higher. There is no froth, frankly, in airlines, for example, or hotel companies or many of those things that are reopening stocks. But nonetheless, Either the tech sell-off is going to gradually spill into everything else and we will get a high correlation breakdown across the board, which will cause a major flush down in the market and then a V-shaped bounce from there. Or we're going to see NASDAQ will stop selling off. We will see Russell will go from red to green, and then we will see S&P will go from red to green, and then we'll see NASDAQ will start to cut its losses and will gradually start to climb back, back towards flat category. I mean, NASDAQ has lost about 600 points since Friday. I understand that in scheme of things, this may sound like, uh, you know, in the short term, it's a lot, but in the long term, this may sound like it's nothing. It's still very little. Nevertheless, in a very short term, that equates to about four, four and a half percent sell off in the entire NASDAQ in the matter of three days. It is a lot. OK, so you will start to see some buying come in in Apple, in Amazon, in Salesforce, in Google, in some of those names. Either that's going to, ha going to happen or this sell off will accelerate to the downside, taking down every Everything else with it. Going back to the S&P chart, I would like to point out the hourly chart here from a technical basis. <clears throat> Last week when we were doing the webinar, I pointed out the technicals and I said that with the S&P making gradually lower highs and lower lows, the first layer of support will come in where this major VOP support is around 3840. You can see right over here. If you go back um, to uh, uh, to 
early February, the first week, February 1st, February 2nd, February 3rd, you will see that's where we, we formed a bit of a bull flag. You can see that was previously the topping, uh, the top for the for the S&P right around 3840, 3850. We consolidated it for a while, came back, tried again, failed again, came back, tried again, but then held up. And then finally, we broke out through that. So there's a lot of lot of people that are long from this area. 3840 to 38.50. In the pre-market right now, the S&P futures are at 38.53. And we bounced off in the overnight session precisely from that 38.40 level. If we take out through, if we break down through all of this VOP support levels, then I could see the flush down scenario come into play. There's not a lot of support coming in in the short term, and we could see a rather catastrophic meltdown over here, which could then result in a V-shaped recovery eventually, maybe by the end of the week or early next week. Or this is the bounce zone, or this is where NASDAQ stops selling off. Russell shows its leadership. All the other sectors that I talked about shows its leaders, show their leadership. And then the market eventually start to form a bottom right here. And we make another recovery back to 3,900. So trying to surgically show you what's in hand over here, focus on how the NASDAQ is going to pressure the rest of the stocks. But so far, even though yesterday may, feel, may have felt like a lot of selling, there's a lot of strength underneath that. You do not get transportation, financials, conf infrastructure, construction, energy, metals and mining, and so many other components working in sync nicely to the upside. And NASDAQ just taking the whole house down. NASDAQ is the biggest component of the S&P. And that's why tech is the biggest component. That's where the risk is. Aside from that, there's a very large ba basket that is actually working. That's it from me. Let's go to Jay. Morning, everyone. Uh, so two quick updates today. Uh, number one on Crocs, uh, C-R-O-X. Uh, the company did report their earnings this morning. Uh, Pre-market, uh, let's see, we're sort looking at, yeah, maybe a couple percentage points. Um, but, you know, I'm not shocked by this because, as I mentioned in the video, you know, some of the surprise potential was eliminated when back in January, the company uh, came out with their uh, revenue guidance hike. Uh, so like I said, some of that surprise was taken away. But overall, a really good quarter. Uh, revenue was up 56.5%. E-commerce revenue up 92%. Wholesale revenue up 52.2%. Uh, retail comps up 40.9%. Gross margins increased 770 basis points. Um, and then looking at the geography breakdown uh, for 2020, the Americas were up 35.7%. EMEA was only up 1.5%, while Asia Pacific was down 19.2%. Um, so on the call, you know, what I'll be looking for, you know, of course, I'll, I'll listen for any commentary on, uh, you know, digital growth, uh, you know, the, the gibbets, uh, you know, uh, product that I talked about on the video, but also to see if they have anything to talk about in terms of the uh, China expansion. I know that was kind of mentioned in their press release today. Um, I know that's something that they are looking at. Um, and as I said, Asia Pacific was down 19.2% in 2020. So uh, I would look for them to, to talk more about that growth potential. Um, so when the, trans when the transcript comes out, I'll take a look at that and I'll probably have it in at least notable call outs tomorrow morning. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. All right, perfect. Yeah, modest pullback. I wouldn't be so much concerned about this. Great quarter as you just, as you just reviewed. Lots of things to like about it. I think eventually this thing is going to go to $100 per share, but nothing goes up in straight line. You're going to see backing and filling every now and then, especially with the market a little bit on the edge. Yeah. And then uh, stock number two uh, is Ritchie Brothers, RBA. Uh, now, this is a stock that you, Fahad, have been asked about in the webinar, in the Q&A session the past couple of times, and really, you know, technically... It's bad. It's atrocious. Um, and over the weekend, we actually got some data to sort of back this up. Um, B of A specifically was out highlighting that last week the company held its premier global auction in Orlando. Um, now, Orlando makes up 20% of the company's Q1 GTV. So keep that in mind. 
Um, now this auction was conducted 100% online. And while the auction set new records across some key metrics, for example, registered bidders were up 25%, uh, total items and lots sold, as well as gross transaction value, disappointed. Uh, GTV of 191 million declined 19% and was the lowest value since the RBA Iron Planet combination. Uh, BFA goes on to say that uh, we are observing similar trends in Orlando to the Houston auction earlier this month. Uh, record registered bidders highlights that RBA is gaining market share, growing its buyer, and over time likely to benefit from a networking effect. That said, our concern for the first half of 2021 centers on equipment availability or lack thereof. The number of equipment lots sold was up 12,000, which was actually down 11% year over year and the lowest Orlando lot count since 2017. Uh, so not only are technicals, you know, uh, not only is the stock getting, you know, clobbered, uh, you now have this data set to sort of back that up. Yeah, and you know, the how much of that do you think has to do with a sim year over year comparisons being very very tough or that's not in play yet considering the pandemic didn't really hit the u.s until late february or march uh, let me see i think b of a had a breakdown let me see if i can find it really quick i can um, just give you my qualitative thoughts on this one you know originally when we presented the bull case in this one and you know me that i sort of most of the time take the technical pictures rather lightly because i think that you know, um, all the all the charts basically shows a path to where the stock has been. It rarely ever shows where the stock could potentially be going, but it is a reflective of the opinions, collective opinions of the market participants. So it cannot be fully ignored. Now, when we first turned bullish on this one, um, and and then the stock started to break up, break down right over here on very heavy volume. I gave it a little bit of a, that was my concern point. I'm like, okay, you know, I do not like breakdowns on high volume because this is a liquidation event. And then subsequently, I never saw this volume retrace. It just kept seeing more and more and more and more of higher volume liquidation patterns. So I think it was around 62 when I said, I'm out of this, it's not working. And I think we are in trouble over here because this thing is being dumped in the market. So here we are from 62 down to 51. And based on this update now, it now confirms what we are seeing. We may still see this thing come down to about 45. That's a major VOP support level comes in. Maybe it's a buy at that point. RSI is now at 23. Because I think that in the original bull case, the long-term things that you had mentioned are still mm -hmm. sticky in nature. They're going to be quite profitable for the company. Mm -hmm. But I think in the short term, it was just way ahead of itself. Yeah. yeah, and that's yeah, that's all I've got for today. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Chronicle. Morning. Um, I have a stock on my watch list that I'm looking to execute in sometime in the near future. Company is Tenable Holdings, T-E-N-B. Uh, this is a cybersecurity and vulnerability risk management solutions provider. Technically speaking, this company is not in direct competition with uh, big guns like CrowdStrike and Cloudflare. Their competitors are more of the analytics and automation variety like Qualys and Rapid7. Um, this is the particular subspace where Tenable operates, so um, doesn't really overlap with our favorites like CrowdStrike and Cloudflare. Just wanted to clear that up uh, before I dive into the bull case. So to give a bit of background, um, this VRM company, Tenable, they're the globally the number one leader when it comes to total device market share at 28%. Uh, they also happen to be the best in class when it comes to the total coverage of um, common vulnerabilities and exposures. Specifically, they have what they call a predictive prioritization technology which is embedded within their solutions, which has the ability to proactively identify the present vulnerabilities that are most likely to emerge within the next 28 days. And in terms of the library, they have the most uh, comprehensive protection. Now, the first part of the bull case really has to do with uh, what I believe to be an overreaction to uh, the conservative revenue guidance, which management provided on February 2nd. Um, if we look at the earnings, the company posted very comfortable beats on EPS and revenue for Q4, 
Uh, but then for the full year revenue guidance, management is forecasting $512.5 million at the midpoint versus consensus $521 million. Uh, so at the surface level, this was a massive miss, undoubtedly. However, I think management is purposely being conservative here because going through the conference call, uh, the CFO, Steve Vince, clearly stated that they are taking the very cautious stance of assuming that the demand environment is going to stay the same as the previous year. And so this guidance is apparently only baking in, um, quote unquote, modestly improving demand um, in the second half of the year. And additionally, the CFO also said that this guidance does not factor in um, any tailwinds from the solar winds breach. So that's not even in the forecast. And I believe this is a very low bar that um, management is setting for themselves for this year. So that's the first part of the bull case. Second part has to do with a stiefel note uh, from late last week in which uh, their analyst, Brad Reback, um, resumed coverage with a buy rating. Uh, this was, there was this one part of his note uh, which really caught my attention, which is he believes that Tenable is only between 20% to 30% uh, penetrated within the company's largest accounts um, in terms of potential for cross-selling uh, plus add-on sales of their newer offerings like Lumen, web application, and operational technology. So as a result, um, Steeple here is expecting that there's going to be some hidden upside in Tenable's dollar-based uh, net retention and billings growth metrics uh, because of cross-selling. And we also have to consider that uh, roughly 50% of the company's sales force has yet to fully ramp. Um, essentially, the point here is that once this marketing team gets up and running, we should expect additional uh, contribution, which may not be fully baked in uh, to expectations here. Um, now, regarding technicals, uh, looking at my annotated chart, uh, the stock has currently pulled back all the way to support. Um, that said, I don't expect it to work right away because there's no immediate catalyst at the moment. And at the same time, uh, we've been discussing internally about the ongoing weakness in tech stocks, which is no doubt going to be a headwind. Uh, but what I'm anticipating is at some point, all this selling in tech stock uh, stocks is going to get exhausted eventually. Um, there's no such thing as a bull market in which tech stocks keep selling off. So looking at this chart, I'm waiting for the stock to form a base and perhaps even make a, a slightly more uh, lower low. Uh, to further force out the weak hands. And then only after that will I consider entering. And um, as for the target, I'm aiming for the recent peak of $55. So about 30 plus percent upside. And this is not a frothy stock either. Yeah, I would just say on the technical side that uh, you, one could be patient with it, don't have to enter here and pretty much, I mean, uh, uh, avoid it for even for a whole month because if there is no catalyst in play right here right so when you get high volume sell-offs like this that we are seeing in the broader tech sector they usually have to shake out a lot and a lot of froth from the market and then they have to form new bases along the way and then after a month or two months of forming bases then there could be set up when the rsi and the macd levels are also are starting to stabilize right now i see macd still coming down hard although we could be reaching that inflection point rsi still has room to come down and the vop support is at 40. stock close at 40 to 86. so let it come in around 40 this was a prior major breakout level on very heavy volume then let it form a base over here for a while and that's when you get the very good attractive entry for a recovery play back to 55 dollars per share but i don't think there's imminent um you know that's going to happen imminently i think it's going to be a while uh you know could just sit and watch but interesting stock um i haven't really traded this in a very very long time i'm aware of the company just never really paid attention to it as much as I have to other cybersecurity companies. All right, folks, we're going to stop over here. Thank you very much for joining. We'll see you in the chat room shortly.